So I want to start this morning by saying every one of us deserves rest. And I'm very grateful that I have a profession where I can take a sabbatical. Many people do not. And to take rest doesn't have to be a, you know, time away for a period of a month or more. Uh, to take rest can be doing exactly what Reverend Terry did, you know, taking a moment to catch your breath, to notice, to be in the present moment. But being restful is countercultural. You know, our society is all about the push and the achievement. And I was thinking back to when I was a stockbroker for E-Trade <laughs> and how much, man, I loved it. It was like a drug. It was so exciting to, to show up and hear the news and to you know, be important and <laughs> you know, be a part of the team, the culture of work. And it was so incredibly toxic for me because I was working so many hours and I was so involved in a pursuit of something that wasn't even necessarily who I was. When I was a little girl, most people thought I would grow up and, I don't know, go to the Peace Corps or be a writer uh, or be a minister. <laughs> when I was Episcopalian, they would have never guessed I would be a UU minister. <laughs> But um, when I was with Carl I, uh, in Florida, we were looking to get out of uh, Florida and kind of fly on our own wings. And I answered an ad, and it turned out to be for this company called E-Trade. I didn't even know really what they did. <laughs> I started out as a customer service rep, answering calls and learning how to do online things. And uh, this was in... 1998, so, um, you know, it was uh, early times, uh, but anyway, I went up the ladder, and I thought, man, I'm, it was exciting, and I was pushing, and, and at that time, I didn't realize how out of balance I was with my life, and um, Carl and I started trying to have children, and that was not happening. <laughs> When you, I was working 60 to 80 hours a week and uh, in something that wasn't feeding my soul, except for my excitement. It was, it was really fun until it wasn't. And the culture changed. And then uh, I had to yell at my uh, teams and I left. So anyway, the, the point being that oftentimes we find ourselves in situations that are not good for us. And I had the luxury to change my career. We don't always have that luxury. Sometimes we are in a job for a while or in a situation for a while. So how do we find rest? And a lot of it is paying attention. Um, Trisha Hersey, writer of the Nat Ministry wrote, you don't need permission from anyone to rest and listen to your body. Let your body be your teacher. Your body knows the way. Your body holds messages of liberation that I can only offer to you, that it can only offer to you while you are in a rested state. One of the deepest lessons as you deprogram from the false teachings of grind culture will be learning to activate your inherent power as a human being. And isn't that interesting? It's like, uh, I know some days when I get super into my task, even in ministry, and I'm working and working, and I'm like, wait a minute, why am I doing that? <laughs> Nobody's sitting over my shoulder telling me I should sit at a desk for umpty ump hours. I should take a break. And I bet you I would write a much better email. <laughs> I'd be a much better listener. I'd be a much happier person if I got up and went up and smelled these gorgeous flowers outside. And so I think we get caught up in the moment. And I still find myself thinking I should be acting like a stockbroker. And I have to deprogram that and be like, whose messages are in my head? And, um, and I think the important thing too is uh, many of us are not sleeping well. Um, there's a report out that one in three Americans are not getting the sleep that we need. And um, 
that's something I know I've struggled with. You know, I either have a busy mind or, you know, I'm a middle-aged woman and for whatever reason that's, that happens to me. And, um, and it's okay to take a nap. Isn't that a great thing? I love Trisha Hersey's idea of nap ministry. You can't always take a nap, but when you get home, I know I, I'll sometimes take a nap for 30 minutes before I do anything else. And, I'm, and Carl thinks this hilarious because I'll turn on Stephen Colbert or the news. And he's like, how do you go to sleep to the news? <laughs> or Stephen Colbert, but it's very, it's very restful to me. So for about 30 minutes, then I'm up, I'm good. And so maybe you'll find something that's restful to you like biking or walking or gardening. Um, so what is it that this sabbatical thing that's happening, what is that? <laughs> Ministers for a long time have, um, were on a lot in, um, you know, in many different ways. And um, we also need time to study. Um, I was telling someone that um, after service, uh, Karen Hirsch often tells me, um, like, oh, I haven't heard that Julie story yet. And I was like, oh, you've heard a lot of my stories. <laughs> I need some new stories. And, and so um, I'm really hoping over this three and a half months that I will live and study and go deep into spiritual practice and come back with new eyes. And I guess and hope and, and dream that you all will also have new awakenings with a new minister here for this period of time with your own ideas and thoughts when I'm not there to, um, you know, jump in. And uh, like I have over the past uh, umpty ump years, you know, and, and I think it's exciting to see, you know, who am I going to be when I'm not in this pulpit, you know? Who am I going to be when I'm uh, gardening my flowers and, and then to come back rested and with thoughts and to be more centered in my ministry. Because for a long ministry, which I have had with you all, you have to sometimes renew yourself. You know, if I had the same sermons and the same stories, it would get a little old. Um, and I know it's time for me to renew. And it's time for me to have Sabbath time, to have rest time. And I'm so grateful to the sabbatical to committee team. And I'm so grateful to Reverend Terry and the board and all of you for allowing this to happen. And so please allow it to happen in your own lives. You know, this is a great time to, in the summer, is when many, I mean, this is a good showing on a summer Sunday. <laughs> Normally we're often traveling and doing our thing. And you know, give yourself that permission to ask the question, why should I be working in this way? Is this healthy? Am I rested? And so as I take my leave from you today, um, just know that my heart is still with you. And, and you are such a great congregation. You are... Um, when people ask me, how's it going in Eau Claire, when I go to ministry retreats, and I'm like, well, let me tell you about this congregation. Let me tell you about these people and this music. <laughs> She's like, yeah. And so I just want you to know that it is an honor and a gift to be your minister. And I have full confidence in Reverend Terry and our board and our amazing staff. We've got Sean Copenhaver over there. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and Amy and Sean, Sean Mensch and Chrissy and everyone. Chris Deere is our rock in the office and, and all things. So thank you. I love you. I'm going to offer a reading. It's called Advice to Myself by Jane Hirschfield. The computer file of which I have no recollection is labeled Advice to Myself. I click it open, look, scroll further down the screen, 
stays backlit and empty. Thus, I meet myself again, hopeful and useless, a mystery, precisely as I must have done on August 19th, 2010, 11.08 a.m. Trying to introduce myself to you, your new temporary and part-time sabbatical minister feels a bit like speed dating. <laughs> what can I possibly share in this moment right now, my very first Sunday in your pulpit, that gets to the heart of this sabbatical time? So I'm going to give it a shot, and I'm going to start with my demographic cohort, which is a fancy term I heard for describing your generation. I am Gen X. I think you are too? Gen X is a pioneering generation in the history of text. Who else is in uh, Gen Xers in the house? Look at all of my beloveds. We are the forgotten generation. <laughs> and yet we're pioneers. We're pioneers in the history of tech because we were the first to grow up with personal computers. I went to high school in a small town in northwestern Minnesota called Proctor, go rails, and that is just up the hill from Duluth at the tip of Lake Superior. This is where I learned to type on an IBM Selectric typewriter. And I took a year of accounting on coursework that was loaded on floppy disks that ran on an Apple Macintosh computer. Not a Mac, an Apple Macintosh computer. College brought me to Augsburg in Minneapolis where I used a fancy program called Adobe PageMaker to lay out and design printed newsletters and flyers and yes, even church bulletins. I was at Augsburg, it's a good Lutheran school, we learned to do church bulletins there. <laughs> I went on to work mostly in the tech industry doing marketing and communications, enamored by hardware and software and all the components and gadgets and tools used to seemingly run the world. After about 18 years and too much volatility and too many job changes, I stepped away. And I didn't know that we share that kind of arc to our stories. We did not plan this. So I stepped away after 18 years in this corporate trajectory, wanting to get off of that hamster wheel. And instead, I had the privilege to be able to face my own blank page, an untitled document, and yet equally without any advice available to myself, just a blank screen. This wasn't a midlife crisis. I wasn't interested in a quick and harsh reboot, no control alt delete. You liking my tech references here? <laughs> I wanted to power down and I was able to go offline and take some time to meet myself, to find a vocation, a vocation, that place where deep gladness and the world's deep need meet. Wisdom from a theologian named Frederick Buckner, who I had not heard of, but whose words expressed my midlife longings. And in that space where I welcomed in openness and curiosity, hope and mystery, I experienced this strange calling to the work and service of ministry, not entirely even knowing what that meant in general and certainly not specifically for what that might mean for me. But I leaped in, I attended United Theological Seminary in the Twin Cities, which makes me a fellow alum of your minister emerita, the Reverend Virginia Wolf. My route to ministerial fellowship with the UUA took time and some unexpected detours, but I was welcomed in 2017 with such joy. I was ordained the following spring by the Church of the Larger Fellowship, the CLF. This is a UU congregation that exists with no geographical boundaries. It uses technology 
as a means to gather and support community from across the United States and beyond. Is anyone here also a member of CLF? Look at that, a couple of you. You can be members of two congregations. <laughs> From my home base in St. Paul, Minnesota, that's where I live, just a short 90-minute drive due west of here. I've served in prisons and re-entry, on staff at my seminary, as a co-interim minister at our congregation in Minnetonka, just west of Minneapolis. And I've served with diverse communities of faith and spiritual practices committed to the work of justice. My primary ministry is as a community minister working for justice, particularly racial justice and climate justice. I have preached and shared meaning making and change actions in multi-faith and multi-community contexts. And this transitory path that I currently travel upon is an enlivening and rewarding form of ministry. I share this particular snapshot of my biography because I think it's so guided by some of the tenets of renewal, like intention and attention and co-creating possibilities. All the ways we can tune into our senses, into these hidden wells of wisdom, ready to uncover and discover what we didn't quite notice before. And I think that is probably one of our wishes for Reverend Julie, that she might have this time of uncovering and discovering. Taking time for reflection and renewal reveals what the past can teach us, what the blank page may evoke, what sparks can illuminate a future that is oriented towards possibility and abundance. I am so heartened to be here in Eau Claire with you these next few months as Reverend Julie honors her own extended Sabbath. I want to lift up a few things that remain true and sure during this sabbatical. You will continue living into your mission and vision. We will practice shared ministry in different ways, both because Reverend Julie won't be here to actively participate with you, and also because you're here with this temporary different minister who's joining you around your campfire. And look it, I even have a t-shirt. <laughs> Yay, Team Eau Claire! <laughs> so over the next few months, UUC will keep on keeping on, but you'll have just a little extra space to look around and cultivate a renewed sense of shared purpose and responsibility. We know we can't control the path, and this certainly isn't a time to make any changes. But we can practice the power of steadiness and thoughtfulness. We can bolster the meaningful connections that flow through this congregation that are readily apparent even to this newcomer. We can be there for one another, and we can be there for the broader community. This is a time to notice, to get curious, maybe try out that 54321 meditation while you're in a meeting or a group gathering, or maybe even here during worship if what I have to say doesn't quite meet you where you're at. Acknowledge what emerges. This is a time to ask new questions and perhaps find different ways to answer all of those who's, what's, when's, where's, and why's. And this is a beautiful time to share stories and to reflect more deeply on your hopes and commitments. And I am especially honored that I get to be present for and help celebrate your congregation's 50th anniversary. These three and a half months are gonna go by quick. I'm excited to get to know you. I probably won't remember your names, but I'll try so hard. Please repeat them every time you see me. I'm excited to work with the board and the staff and the lay ministers and the community members. So let us breathe together, because by breathing together, we'll know where we're going together. May this time.